I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but first impressions are often entirely wrong. You can look at a painting for the first time, for example, and not like it at all. But after looking at it a little longer, you may find it very pleasing. First time you try gorgonzola cheese, you might find it too strong. But when you're older, you might want to eat nothing but gorgonzola cheese. Klaus, when Sunny was born, did not like her at all. But by the time she was six weeks, the two of them were thicker than thieves. Your initial opinion on just about anything might change over time. I wish I could tell you that the Baudelaire's first impression of Count Olaf and his house were incorrect, as first impressions so often are. But these impressions, that Count Olaf was a horrible person and his house was depressing p- pigsty, were absolutely correct. During the first few days after the orphans arrived at Count Olaf, Violet, Klaus, and Sonny attempted to make themselves feel at home. But it was really no use. Even though Count Olaf's house was quite large, the three children were placed together in one filthy bedroom that had only one small bed in it. Violet and Klaus took turns sleeping in it, so that every other night one of them was in the bed and the other was sleeping on the hard wooden floor. When the bed's mattress was so lumpy, it was difficult to say who was more uncomfortable. To make a bed for Sunny, Violet removed the dusty curtains from the curtain rod and hung over the bedroom's one window and brunched them together in some sort of cushion, just big enough for her sister. However, without curtains over the cracked glass, the sun streamed through the window every morning, so the children woke up early and sore each day. Instead of a closet, there was a large cardboard box that had once held a refrigerator and who now hold the three children's clothes, all piled in a heap. Instead of toys, books, and other things to amuse the youngsters, Count Olaf had provided a small pile of rocks, and the only decoration on the peeling walls was a large, ugly painting of an eye mashing the one on Count Olaf's ankle and all over the house. But the children knew, as I'm sure you know, that the worst surroundings in the world can be tolerated if people in them are interesting and kind. Count Olaf was neither interesting nor kind. He was demanding, short-tempered, and sm- b- bad-smelling. The only good thing to be said for Count Olaf is that he wasn't around very often. When the children woke up and chose their clothing out of the refrigerator box, they could walk into the kitchen and find a list of instructions left for them by Count Olaf, who would often not appear until nighttime. Most often, the days he spent out of the house or up in the high tower where the children were forbidden to go. The instructions he left for them were usually difficult chores, such as repainting the back porch or repairing the windows. Instead of a signature, Count Olaf would draw an eye at the bottom of the note. One morning, his note read, My theater troupe will be coming for dinner before tonight's performance. Have dinner ready for all ten of them by the time they arrive at seven o'clock. Buy the food, prepare it, set the table, serve dinner, clean up afterwards, and stay out of the way. Below that, there was the usual eye, and underneath the note, there was a small sum of money for the groceries. Violet Klaus read the note as they ate their breakfast, which was a gray and lumpy oatmeal Count Olaf left for them each morning in a large pot on the stove. Then they looked at each other in dismay. None of us know how to cook, Klaus said. That's true, Violet said. I know how to repair those windows and know and how to clean the chimney, because those sort of things interest me. But I don't know how to cook anything except toast. And sometimes you burn the toast, Klaus said, and they smile. They were both remembering the time when the, the two of them got up early to make a special breakfast for their parents. Violet had burnt the toast, and their parents, smelling smoke, ran downstairs to see what was the matter. When they saw Violet and Klaus looking forlornly at the piece of pitch black toast, they laughed and laughed and then made pancakes for the whole family. I wish they were here, Violet said. She did not have to explain. She was talking about their parents. They would never let us stay in this dreadful place. If they were here, Klaus said, his voice rising as he got more and more upset. We would not be in Count Olaf's at the first place. I hate it here, Violet. I hate this house. I hate our room. I hate having to do these chores, and I hate Count Olaf. I hate it too, Violet said, and Klaus looked at his older sister in relief. Sometimes just saying that you hate something and having someone agree with you can make you feel better about the terrible situation. I hate everything about our lives right now, Klaus, she said, but we have to keep our chin up. 
This is what an expression the children's father had used, and it meant to try and stay cheerful. You're right, Klaus said, but it's very difficult to keep one's chin up when Count Olaf keeps shoving it down. Juke, Sunny shrieked, banging on the table with her oatmeal spoon. Bob and Klaus were jerked out of their conversation to look once again at Count Olaf's note. Perhaps we could find a cookbook and read about how to cook, Klaus said. It shouldn't be that difficult to make a simple meal. Von Klaus spent several minutes opening and shutting Count Olaf's kitchen cupboards, but there weren't any cookbooks to be found. I can't say I'm surprised, Violet said. We haven't found any books in this house at all. I know, Klaus said miserably. I miss reading very much. We must go out and look for a library sometime soon. But not today, Violet said. Today we have to cook for ten people. And at the moment, there was a knock at the front door. Violet and Klaus looked at one another nervously. Who in the world would want to visit Count Olaf, Violet wondered out loud. Maybe somebody wants to visit us, Klaus said, without much hope. In, it, in the time since the Baudelaire parents' death, most of the Baudelaire orphans' friends had fallen by the wayside in an expression that means they stopped calling, writing, and stopping by to see any of the Baudelaires, making them very lonely. You and I, of course, would never do this to any of our grieving acquaintances. But this is the sad truth of life. When someone has lost a loved one, friends sometimes avoid the person just when the, pr the presence of a friend is most needed. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny walked slowly to the front door and peered through the peephole, which was the shape of an eye. They were delighted to see Justice Strauss peering back at them and the opened the door. Justice Strauss, Violet called. How lovely to see you. She was about to add, do you come... Do come in, and then she realized that Justice Strauss would probably not want to venture inside the dim and dirty room. Please forgive me for not stopping by sooner, Justice Strauss said, as the Baudelaire's stood awkwardly in the doorway. I wanted to see how you children were settling in, but I had a very difficult case in the high court, and it was taking up much of my time. What sort of case was it? Klaus asked. Having been deprived of reading, he was hungry for new information. I can't really discuss it, Justice Strauss said, because it's official business. But I can tell you it concerns a poisonous plant and the illegal use of someone's credit card. Yika! Sunny shrieked, and it appeared to mean how interesting. Although, of course, there was no, no way that Sunny could understand what was being said. Justice Strauss looked down at Sunny and laughed. Yika, indeed, she said, and reached down to pat Sunny on the head. Sunny took Justice Strauss's hand and bit it gently. That means she likes you, Violet explained. She bites very, very hard if she doesn't like you, and or if you want to give her a bath. I see, Justice Strauss said. Now then, how are you children getting on? This, is there anything you desire? The children looked at one another, thinking of all the things they desired. Another bed, for example. A proper crib for Sunny. Curtains for the windows in their room. A closet instead of a cardboard box. But what they desired most of all, of course, was not to be associated with Count Olaf in any way whatsoever. What they desired most was to be with their parents again, in their true home, but that, of course, was impossible. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny all looked down at the floor unhappily. As they considered the question, finally Klaus spoke. Could we perhaps borrow a cookbook? He said, Count Olaf has instructed us to make dinner for his theater troupe tonight, and we can't find a cookbook in this house. Goodness, Justice Strauss said. Cooking dinner for an entire theater troupe seems like a lot to ask of children. Count Olaf gives us a lot of responsibility, Violet says. What he, she wanted to say was Count Olaf is an evil man, but she was well-mannered. Well, why don't you come next door to my house, Justice Strauss said, and find a cookbook and, that pleases you. The youngsters agreed and followed Justice Strauss out the door and over to her well-kept house. She led them through the elegant hallway, smelling of flowers, to an enormous room, and when they saw what was inside, they nearly fainted with delight, Klaus especially. The room was a library. Not a public library, but a private library. That is, a large collection of books belonging to Justice Strauss. There were shelves and shelves of them on every wall and floor and ceiling, and separate shelves and shelves of them in the middle of the room. The only place that there weren't books was in one corner where there were some large comfortable looking chairs and wooden table with a lamp hanging over them perfect for reading although it was not as big as their parents library it was cozy and the Baudelaire children were thrilled my word Violet said this is a wonderful library thank you very much Justice Strauss said 
I've been collecting books for years, and I'm very proud of my collection. As long as you keep them in good condition, you're welcome to use any of my books at any time. Now the cookbooks are over here in the eastern wall. Shall we look at them? Yes, Violet said. And then, if you don't mind, I should love to look at your books concerning mechanical engineering. Inventing things is a great interest of mine. And I would like to look at your books on wolves, Klaus said. Recently, I have been fascinated by the subject of wild animals of North America. Book, Sunny shrieked, which meant, please don't forget to pick out a picture book for me. Just as Strauss smiled, it's a pleasure to see all young people interested in books, she said. But first, I think we better find a good recipe, don't you? The children agreed, and for 30 minutes or so, they pursued several cookbooks that Just as Strauss recommended. To tell you the truth, the three orphans were excited to be outside of Cowdoloff's house and this pleasant library, and that they were a little distracted and unable to concentrate on cooking. But finally Klaus found a dish that sounded delicious and easy to make. Listen to this, he said, Puntinasca. It's an Italian sauce for pasta, and we need to do is saute onions, carper, anchovies, garlic, chopped parsley, and tomatoes together in a pot, and prepare spaghetti to go with it. That sounds easy, if I agreed. The Bowler orphans looked at one another. Perhaps with the kind Justice Strauss on her library next door, the children could prepare pleasant lives for themselves as easily as making Pontinesca sauce for Count Olaf.